Hello, this is your professor, Adam Dunstan. Today we will be talking about ethnicity, race, and multilingualism through the perspective of linguistic anthropology. And I want to acknowledge at the outset uh, that I am, or self-identify as, white, and so that's my positionality. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge positionality in discussions like this. So, uh, my plan for this lecture First, I'm going to cover what do we mean as linguistic anthropologists by the term race and ethnicity. Then, we'll talk about the O'Connor reading, uh, specifically about multilingualism in baseball. We'll follow that by talking about some of the language that we use about race. We'll specifically look at the U.S. Census, among other things. And then we'll, have, um, we'll talk a little bit about how people use language as a way of identifying themselves or others as belonging to specific racial or ethnic categories. And we'll specifically talk about Apache jokes among other examples. And one of the sort of underlying themes for this entire lecture then that I want to be talking about is the way that language is used to talk about race and ethnicity, but also the way that language is used to talk about race and ethnicity even when we're not talking about race and ethnicity. And so what I mean by that is the way in which we use specific language practices to talk about or identify as specific groups even when we're not overtly saying this person is black, or this person is white, or this person is um, Asian, or any other category we might have. So that's the plan for this lecture. I do want to cover a couple of terms first, just to clarify. Uh, we'll talk about race and ethnicity, because those terms are very often used interchangeably, synonymously in American English. Um, and, you know, some scholars would argue that they don't have a lot of meaningful distinction because we tend to use them interchangeably. However, in theory, there is an important distinction there. So we use the term race when we're talking about a socially constructed category, as we've talked about a lot in this class. It's based on an assumption of, I'm kind of oversimplifying here, but I call it continental shared biology, right? The idea that we can sort of assign all of Africa to a race called black or all of Europe to a race called white. Um, or all of Asia, this gigantic continent, to a race called Asian. So it's this idea of an assumption of continentally shared biology is often, although not always, skin color related and otherwise related to a very small set of traits. So that's what we mean by race, of course. We all understand the concept, I think, um, but I just wanted to kind of refresh our memories because that's distinct from the term ethnicity. Um, you'll notice on the U.S. Census or a lot of like college applications and things like that, places where you need to mark your race, that sometimes, especially in the U.S. Census, they'll have a question about race, but also a question about ethnicity, um, where they'll typically ask if you are Hispanic and or Latino. So the reason is those actually aren't, race and ethnicity are not actually the same thing. Um, so ethnicity is essentially a group that identifies or is identified by others, and typically both, they're both identified by others and identified by themselves as somehow distinct based on shared attributes, a shared history, a shared culture, uh, a shared language. So um, in that regard, for example, I do work in the American Southwest, and it is not uncommon in the American Southwest for people to use the term Anglo as a more specific word than white to when they specifically want to talk about English-speaking um, people of European descent living in the Southwest. And so it's sort of a racial term, but more so a cultural term, and it's used because of the very high percentage of people who may also self-identify as white, but who are um, Spanish speakers, and it's sort of used as a distinguishing mark there, and also to distinguish between that um, Anglo quote-unquote culture and then, um, sorry, Native American people. So, yeah, ethnicity, groups that self-identify based on shared attributes, especially cultural and historical. Um, Barth, who's a famous linguistic slash cultural anthropologist back in 1969, he had a good point. He said, you know, it's always a negotiation of, like, inside and outside forces, internal and external forces. There's forces that cause people to identify as a group, and then there's outside forces where we label people. So, for example, the Navajo group that I work with came to think of came to start using the term Diné to refer, or started, came to think of themselves as a single homogenous nation, in part due to cultural traumas experienced under colonialism. And so it's external pressures as well as internal pressures that lead to how people identify. So race and ethnicity, different things. Not only that, but they're both different than culture, because we sometimes use ethnicity and culture to mean the same thing, and we should not. Uh, so let me share with you a really simple example most of us will be familiar with for why ethnicity and culture aren't the exact same thing. 
So you'll often hear in the U.S. Uh, either Hispanic or Latino or Latina or sometimes Latinx to refer to people, from, broadly speaking, whose ancestors are from Latin American countries, although technically Hispanic could also be people from Spain. But uh, broadly speaking, people from Latin American countries. And usually when people use the term, they mean specifically people from Spanish-speaking Latin American countries. Um, so that's an ethnic term, right, that is present in the United States. However, if you think about all the different countries of Latin America, there are hundreds of distinct cultures in Latin America. Uh, so for example, let's just say you were in sort of crossing through Peru and then up through Central America and then up into uh, Mesoamerica, Central America, and then up into Mexico, you'd be crossing the borders and boundaries of several different indigenous groups, such as, for example, uh, Quechua people, such as Mayan people, such as Nahua people. Lots of different groups eventually go far enough north in Mexico, Odom people. So you have all these different indigenous groups, not to mention other kinds of cultures um, and kind of distinct groups, including sort of urban mestizo populations, as one example. You're also passing through multiple different racial categories in the sense that people from Latin American countries can be many, many different races, right? Uh, and so being Latin, you could be, you know, from a Latin American country and identify as Latino when you move to the United States, also identify as black, and then also potentially have ancestry from a specific uh, indigenous background as well, right? So language, race, ethnicity, not the same thing. That might seem like a whole lot of clarification of things you already knew, and it probably is, except for, as we'll see in a moment with this lecture, as clear as that looks on paper, people very often collapse all of these terms together and collapse them and then also mix them in with language and assume that because somebody speaks a certain language that you can predict their race, their ethnicity, and their culture. So that's what we'll talk about in just a moment. Just kidding, I'm actually just gonna keep lecturing on this video, I don't wanna cut it there, so here we go. My wife is laughing at me in the other chair right now. Okay, so you did a reading from O'Connor, which was called, What Does Baseball's Bilingualism Reveal? And I thought that was a cool article um, it also has the advantage of not being political, and because and, I know we've had a lot of political examples in recent weeks, I had a comment about that in my uh, surveys that we did, and so this is an advantage of being something I think we can all sort of get around, right? Baseball. Love it or hate it, baseball is an American thing, and yet, precisely because we identify it as an American thing, it becomes a grounds in which you have interesting language politics and cultural politics sometimes going on. So that article was interesting, and I'm not going to rehash the entire article since you should have already read it, um, except to say I thought there were a few useful concepts in there. First of all, the idea of mock Spanish. So there's a longer article that I don't was going to have you read and decided not to that talks about mock Spanish uh, among restaurant owners, and this was filled. This was research done back in the 90s, I think, late 90s, and it was with English-speaking owners of Mexican food restaurants who would oftentimes have a um, workers, some of whom were Hispanic and some of whom were not, and who were predominantly English, uh, first, their first language was predominantly English. So the English speakers, particularly the managers and owner in this study would often use what Hill is calling mock Spanish. So things like cheapo, things like terms that are not actually Spanish terms, but are made to sound like Spanish terms, or using a few Spanish terms here and there, sometimes correctly, sometimes very incorrectly, such as peso. And so uh, that case study kind of mirrors this baseball one in the sense that we've got this concept that we've seen from a lot of different studies of where American English speakers often adopt little bits and pieces of Spanish in a way that really doesn't kind of do full justice to Spanish uh, and some would argue kind of leads to stereotyped, or maybe not leads to, but reinforces kind of stereotyped portrayals of um, Spanish as a language. That's a little different, though, than what's being talked about in this baseball article, because here we're talking about people who are sort of intentionally trying to be bilingual, and their various success with it, and kind of the code switching when they switch back and forth between English and Spanish, and the success that they do or don't have. And so they talk about, for example, Nate McClough, um, formerly of the Orioles, and hit one of his, um, as you probably know, as the article talks about, many, many baseball players at present are from Latin American countries uh, or speak Spanish as a first language. So Nate McClough um, has learned to speak Spanish quite well, even though English is his first language. And so Alexi Casilla, his fellow baseball player, says, it's amazing when you see an American guy speaking perfect Spanish. And then other people say, like, oh, he, 
he must f- be from the Dominican Republic secretly. Uh, and then somebody else, a news reporter, says he brings the clubhouse together. But as your uh, article kind of correctly points out, nobody thinks that says that Alexi Casilla brings the um, clubhouse together. He is fully bilingual in both English and Spanish, but because Spanish is his first language, that doesn't seem as impressive that he picked up English. It seems impressive that McLeod went from English and then picked up Spanish. So this brings up what we call the paradox of bilingualism, where very often in the United States, and you would see similar patterns in other countries presumably, but definitely here in the United States, English is thought to be sort of this like default, even though ironically it's not the official language of the United States. We don't have an official language of the United States, but English is sort of the lingua franca for a lot of things, certainly the majority language. And so it's just assumed that immigrants to the United States are supposed to pick up English as part of the Americanization process. However, so if somebody is bilingual in Spanish and English, having immigrated from, let's say, Cuba, nobody's particularly like, whoa, right? It's like, yeah, that's part of the process. But conversely, when an American English speaker picks up Spanish to speak to his team, 50% of whom are Hispanic, he is not seen as, or he's seen as like, wow, this is very impressive. What a great thing he's doing for unity on his team and things like that. So sort of this paradox of bilingualism, um, where the language that's most powerful in a situation is kind of seen as like, you know, um, giving extra effort to include people by learning a second language, but other people are sort of just expected to adopt a second language by virtue of the necessity of survival. Um, And, you know, we often don't realize in that regard how many people who are either immigrants or in marginalized positions in the United States are bilingual or multilingual by sheer fact of necessity that you have to be.